This is the Bob Cordaro Show on TV. They fought for us, now he'll fight for you. The pursuit of justice and liberty. It's the Bob Cordaro Show on TV. And now, Bob Cordaro. Great good morning, everyone. Happy Sunday. My name is Bob Cadaro, and this is The Bob Cadaro Show on TV. I'm a native son of this region, born, raised, and returned. I've practiced law, started businesses, run for political office, won, and lost. Along the way, I had the blessed fortune to have five kids and about that many bulldogs. Lately, some of you have become aware of me as a daily radio host on WILK, where I carry on every day about this great area and this amazing country. When we watch the insanity of our leadership class, elected and self-appointed, we worry for ourselves, our children, our grandchildren, friends, neighbors, and this place we call home. And we worry for our country in this world, which is being torn apart by people who care more about their power, privilege, and control over you than they do about the people they're supposed to lead, protect, and help succeed. And what about all of you? What is it about this part of Pennsylvania? I've been around you and known you all my life. You are great workers, innovators, business people. You're the best of mothers, fathers, friends, neighbors, and human beings. You are the greatest patriots, soldiers, citizens, and Americans. You are America. Now, this won't be like the radio show I do every day, however. On WILK, we do a lot of politics, a lot of criticism, and a lot of opinions. For this TV show, we want to accentuate the positive to feature those who have achieved and have or want connections to this region. So it's a whole different ballgame, the Bob Cadaro Show on TV. Today in our regular health segment, we have Dr. Brian France, a world-renowned periodontist who is from this area and practices here. Today, he's going to discuss the surprising and scary ramifications of vaping. We don't think about that. Vaping is supposed to be the safe alternative to smoking, but is it? Dr. France will tell us a little bit about that. Open wide. Our power player of the week is Ryan Lecky. Ryan burst onto the scene here in Northeast and Central Pennsylvania on Channel 16. His energy, spirit, and joy de vivre made us all fans. And this morning, I want to explore who this ball of fire is, what makes him tick, what motivates him. And what is he up to now? So, with the help of God, our families, our communities, and each other, let us begin. Dr. Brian France is an internationally recognized periodontist. He heads a multi-specialty dental practice in Dunmore and has consulted, lectured, and taught around the world in his chosen field. Well, for our regular health segment, we're joined by Dr. Brian France. And something that he brought to my attention that alerted me, Vaping, Brian France. Vaping is, it was supposed to be the healthy alternative to smoking. And we're finding a lot of things out about it, aren't we? We are, Bob. And uh, vaping or the use of electronic cigarettes, same thing, Mm -hmm. is an urgent problem in the United States. And I want to say that again. It's an urgent problem Hmm. to the point where the United States Surgeon General uh, claimed it to be an epi- it's an epidemic portions. Okay, uh, in our practice, you know, we have a, a practice where we get involved in complicated reconstructions, tooth reconstructions, and what we've noticed over the last several years is more and more younger people, patients, coming to us for these reconstructions as a result of vaping. So. It's a serious problem. Um, As you alluded to in the opening remarks, uh, it was marketed as an alternative and a safe alternative to cigarette smoking. And in fact, um, based on what I'm seeing just from an oral health perspective, I think it can be much worse. Uh, the The way it works, if you will, is the electronic cigarette is simply a battery operated device that when ignited, it heats a tobacco product, which has nicotine in it, 
and other chemicals, glycerin, glycerol, and flavors. And the flavors is really how the companies market this. Mm -hmm. There's like 150 different flavors, everything from Cheerios to, yeah. uh, you know, you name it, and they've, they've, got, they've got the flavor for, to attract the younger population. Uh, the older population, they tend to use it as an alternative to, to smoking. And so, you know, the, the, the tobacco companies have done a beautiful job in terms of marketing it to the two different segments. What happens is the once it's ignited and inhaled, uh, it the chemicals actually adhere to the teeth and form a very sticky substance, and the glycerol is converted to almost a sugar product, which destroys the teeth. So that's part one. It's very very cariogenic or cavity producing. Number two, it dries the saliva. So now you've got a perfect storm. You've got chemicals that cause decay with reduced saliva. And when patients have reduced saliva, they lose the buffering capacity, meaning that things are more acidic in their mouth. Mm -hmm. So now you've got the perfect storm for rampant decay. Recent studies have, as, have also shown that uh, the vaping, the aerosol, it's actually considered an aerosol, uh, not only dries the mucosa, but leads to periodontal disease and an increase in oral cancer. So it's a very serious problem. There's also some studies coming out now in the medical literature to indicate that there's problems with anxiety, depression, lung problems. Um, in fact, yeah, some of the, some of the, what's interesting is that when the vape is actually taken in, 45% of it stays in the mouth. So that's pretty high content staying in the mouth. So it has plenty of opportunity to do the damage, right? But 40% of it actually makes it to the lungs. So you can see that the potential to have we, we, medical we're, problems. We're going to have to keep that. talking about this because this mm -hmm. is, it is an emergent, and you just said, urgent issue, it vaping. Is. Dr. Yeah. Franz, thank you so much. My pleasure, Appreciate Bob. It. And now, the Sunday Brunch Power Player of the Week on the Bob Cordaro Show. Well, we're joined by Ryan Leckie. And, uh, you know, you burst onto the scene here in Northeast Pennsylvania. I love the way you said that. Burst on, like, <laughs> you well, make me feel like I did something. That's, no, that's cool. That's you. Uh, you come from Johnstown originally, right. you had told me. Tell me a little bit about your upbringing. So the Cliff Notes, how I got started, I should say, in media, television, where I grew up, Johnstown, Pennsylvania. I used to ride my bike to my hometown station. I was like 13 14 and I had the Trapper Keeper, remember those? No. You know, with the Velcro and I had like the Power Rangers on it, I don't even know, and you'd whoosh, rip it open and I would go in there and I would wait in the lobby for the general manager to come down so I can pitch him ideas to get teenagers to watch the news, right? But back then and even now, like the key demographic for television What year are we news, talking? Let's put it in context. Oh my gosh, well, I don't know, thir when I was like 13, 14, but like when I first started there, just so we don't go back too far, it was like 2001. Okay. when I first TV job, right? Yeah. But I mean, if you back up how I kind of got in the door so early when I was 18, when I was just starting my undergrad and I'm working at a television station is I was pitching these ideas to a general, the general manager of the station. I'm like, I have all these great ideas to watch the news. And he's like, okay, thanks. See you later. And I'm like, yeah. I'll wait for you by your car. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding. But so, a true, yeah. but a true, like I just hey, knew I, I wanted to do this. It. Yeah. And yeah. so you had this drive, you had these ideas, you had right. these concepts. And it's 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 a classic tale yeah. and that goes if, back almost generationally, where yeah, yeah. that wasn't done your your age group, right? Not in like twelve, thirteen, right? Riding a yeah, bike, you're pitching, a pitching to a TV station, and it's funny. And my you know my old bosses at WNEP and the and the team there, many I still speak with, they would tell you the same thing. I was still like that a year ago. Hey, I got a I got a binder <laughs> full of ideas, and I'm like, oh god, here he comes again. <laughs> But, you know, when you back up, so I started in television, you know, I was on the radar when I was 12, 13, right? And they're like, well, keep in touch. And I knew some family friends who still worked at the station. Fast forward, I turn 18, graduate high school, ready to start my undergrad at the University of Pittsburgh at Johnstown. They had a behind the scenes job that opened in the control room at WJAC TV, which was an NBC affiliate. Mm -hmm. And learning how to execute a newscast, tape loading, running cameras, all this stuff. And I'm like, sign me up, right? And I'm like, I would do it for free. And they paid me, it was great. Cause I was like, the experience I was yeah. getting while I was doing my undergrad, I'm like, this was amazing. So I did that. Which, by the way, I don't think a lot of people could picture you as a behind the camera guy. Yeah, but I learned so as much. As we know you. Yeah, you I know? had a whole new appreciation. And I ultimately knew I wanted to do reporting and, and, and be on the air and, and just live television, right? I just loved it. 
but I really was able to dig in and learn how to execute a newscast, right? Everything I mentioned, the technical aspect of it. So I did that for about six months, and then at WJC, the first station I started at, a number of people left the news department at once. They got jobs other places, and they're like, wow, we need help. So at that time, two people who you know were well known at WNEP, I worked with John Meyer and Julie Sedoni, yeah. who you know worked there twenty plus years, and John Meyer is still at WNEP TV on the morning show now. So we worked together. I worked with John on weekends back in the day. He was a great mentor, taught me so much. So I would Good work guy. in the yeah, great guy. I would work in the control room, and then in my downtime, I would go up there and be like, John, teach me how to write a script, right? Julie, show me how to do this. And it kind of like one thing led to the next, and then I was like the go-to guy on the weekend. So I would go out in one man band. I would shoot, write, edit my own stuff. I would come back with like eight stories like of a community walk or a fundraiser. I'd have it all in the rundown. And it was funny, I was learning how to write like for television. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't that great. John would come in and we joked about it and he would be like, control, alt, delete, right? Let's start over. <laughs> um, but it was great, like I learned so much. But I, that was sort of like my training ground while I was getting my undergraduate degree. Yeah. And then what happened was how I got started in television news in the news department. I started voicing stories, which I sounded like a little like a little mouse. Like I, I didn't know how to voice and track stuff. So I would like start tracking like Super Bowl stories. And then I had then I did stand ups and stories where you would see me right as like the reporter Ryan. I had the yeah. worst comb over. I uh, had a terrible like worse tan in the can than I got going on today. Right. <laughs> um, and then you know I started just doing like the one man banding and all of that other stuff and then one thing led to the next and then I started filling and anchoring by the time I was 19 I solo anchored my first newscast again terrible come wow. over but, all right, so yeah. let's let's go back to that day yeah did did you get told last minute that you were going to anchor the newscast or did you know what kind no, of prep they, time they did basically you I think it was a holiday and nobody wanted to do it so like I guess we'll let Lecky do it right wow <laughs> Yeah, no, but it was great. Do you remember the date? Oh yeah, it actually it was it was one. It was like I think a weekend newscast, and then the next one I did was like another holiday. It was around that time, right? And um, I anchored with like the morning anchor who was busting me all morning. He's like, "You look like my kid," you know, because mm -hmm. I I literally look like I was twelve on TV. But I was so grateful because people gave me a shot. They're like, "Here's a guy who's been coming pitching us ideas since he was twelve or thirteen. He loves like television, learning, reporting, right?" And one thing led to the next. And it's so funny how, you know, my time there, like I, I did weather before I left, yeah. you know, because they needed somebody to do fill in weather. And the chief meteorologist, when he would leave at 1130 at night, would pre-plan the forecast because it was all automated and computer generated. Mm -hmm. And I'd have to go in front of the green screen and be like, there's a lot coming our way. <laughs> you know what I mean? I didn't know how to do like meteorology, right? But you just made it happen in television and it worked. So I did that at um, WJC TV for four and a half years while I did my undergrad at the University of Pittsburgh at Johnstown. And this is back in the day and age where you would send out resumes and tapes, like VHS yeah. tapes, yeah. right? I sent out 68 resumes and tapes and I got three calls. One was from WNEP. I think another one was in Florida and, and another spot somewhere else. What, what was your goal? So you you start this group. Do you have a specific goal? Yeah, move up in markets, right? Just I move like, up in markets. I want to just keep climbing the ladder and I want to end up. To be what though? Did You You didn't care if it was weather. You didn't care if it was features. You didn't care oh, if it was news. No, I wanted to be like Matt Lauer on the Today Show back okay, in the day. So that's... Or, or like a Savannah Guthrie, right? Okay. I was like, I want to be on the Today Show. That okay. was like way back then. Because that's, that's before social media was around yeah. and even a blip on the radar, right? Yeah. So I do this for four and a half years. I send out 68 resumes and VHS tapes. I get three calls, but I literally, this is back in the day where companies would send you a postcard, rejection letters, like, mm -hmm, hey, you got mm -hmm. your stuff, but we decided to move in another direction. I had enough rejection letters to wallpaper a small bathroom. No joke. And I talk about that all the time. I had like, I made no money. I always tell people and they're like, oh, why'd you get in the TV for the money? My first job in television, I made $6.75 for almost four years. Mm. I got a pay bump right before I left and I thought I was killing it, right? Yeah. Yeah, it was Maybe. insane. So then I sent out these resumes and tapes, got three calls. One was here. I came here and had a few interviews. And I knew the legacy of WNEP. John Meyer then was working there. My former coworker, Julie Sidoni, who wow. spent a number of years at WNEP, they were there. So I kind of felt like, wow, I'm kind of back with my people, right? Was and, this a natural market to jump yeah. to from Johnstown? At the time, and now television markets change all the time yeah. with ratings and at the time, I was in like a top 100. I was like market 98 in my first job. That number has since changed. And I think at the time, WNEP was in like the 50s. So I went from like a small market to a medium market, as we mm -hmm. would describe mm -hmm. in television. Then my goal was like, I'm going to get to a larger market. I'm going to go to Pittsburgh and then maybe New York City, right? 
And it's so funny because when I came here in television, right, you sign contracts. So it's like a two-year deal, then a three-year deal. And when I was here, I started as a reporter, as many people remember, like news reporter, right? Wednesday through Sunday was my shift. So I would work the morning show Wednesday mm -hmm. through Friday in the morning, uh, like the 3 a.m. wake up call, right? Um, and then weekends, I would work like a nine to, nine to six. Yeah. And, uh, and it was tough because by like five o'clock, I was ready to go back to sleep, right? So in any case. How is that morning thing? Uh, you're, the morning you're, like you're, hours? You're, yeah, you're in a different, you're literally yeah. living on a different yeah. planet than everyone else. Right. Yeah. It starts at, <laughs> what, three in the morning? In more ways than one, we kind of <laughs> were on a different planet, right? Um, no, but I think people would say that about Snedeker, right? Yeah. Who's, so, oh, yeah. who's so creative and great, but like, you know, that's what works. So what happened was, you know, when I started out here, I, I said Wednesday through Friday was in the mornings and I was just doing a lot of the news, right? News stuff like, hey, here's what happened in last night's city council meeting. At that time, I don't think a lot of local television at the time was as forward thinking or the audiences hadn't really shifted mm -hmm. to morning television where they are today. Like mm -hmm. where you're reaching mass audiences, yeah. where you're telling people, here's what's happening tomorrow or three days from now, this is what you want to do this weekend, right? So I started just innovating, innovating my job when I was at WNEP. Like I started Wednesday through Friday and I, you know, mainly morning news, news stuff, the mm -hmm. car crashes and everything else. And then weekends I reported, but then I started like peppering some community events in. And some fundraisers. And it was how, how did you do that? Because you oh. you, you invented a position. I, and I, yeah. Joe Snedeker is another guy we're going to talk to at some point. You invented something. Like the lucky line. Certainly thing. in yeah. this market, you invented a different position. Yeah. It I mean, was, it, it didn't exist. I think it was... There was so much to the position. I always kind of joke with people, like the job I had was sort of like what Diane Sawyer got to do at GMA. Like yeah. I would do some very serious stories, hard hitting stuff, but then also I would do the fun stuff, whether it was the Bloomsburg Fair that was going on, mm -hmm. or just a great way to promote a community cause. And I thought in local television, I had a lot of support too. I had great managers who I worked with, who I'm like, I have another idea. They're like, all right, come on in. We'll hear what you have mm -hmm. to say, right? But when we started doing it, the response, like people were reaching out and they're like, hey, we got something else going on in our community. And I think it was a great way to get into all the great nooks and crannies of Northeastern and Central Pennsylvania, maybe some areas that never had the spotlight to show like, yo, there's something really good going on in your backyard and you want to come here this weekend. Yeah. And it was one thing after the next. And then they added more staff to the morning show so I could focus on that because I loved, I mean, people didn't realize I booked, produced and, you know, lined up all of my stuff you know, weeks, months in advance, sometimes in the summer. Now I had a great support team behind me who would be like, here's a crazy idea, you should try to set this up. But I made the calls, talked to all the people, yeah. and it was fun. And I'm kind of like a type, not A, type AAA personality, right? So I love to control sort of like the start to finish of what that content and, and my Indeed. segment could look like. So that was producing graphics and getting the information and working with our graphic artist. And, and this is where I, I would guess your behind the scenes start really paid off. Oh, yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, from day one, when I started when I was 18, you know, you're writing what we call in television, you know, like the graphics at the bottom of the screen. We call them chirons or lower yeah. thirds. And you're learning how to write a great headline, something catchy and witty. And I always love that. And I would play off of my coworkers when we think of like some insane headlines, right? If we were doing like weird events or like, you know, not like the typical community happenings. Yeah. And it was great. And oh my gosh. And then, so I really thought, you know, in television, talking about the markets, I thought, okay, I'm going to be here for a few years. Right. And then move on to some other city and just keep doing this. So but I kept innovating my role and I was mm -hmm, loving it. Mm -hmm. Right. So I started the Wednesday through Sunday. Then my one boss at the time said, you know, this is taken off. Do you want to move Monday through Friday? I worked weekends for eight and a half years. Right. Holidays for 21 years. That's part of the, the nature yeah. of the beast. And I didn't mind it because I loved it. And coming back to what you said about, gosh, that ungodly hour, right? Like yeah. my alarm, I would say out of 90 percent of the time in 21 years, usually blared at 2 a.m. Because my last job before I came to Northeastern and Central Pennsylvania, I worked on a morning show. So I was still getting up at 2 a.m. And you, I don't want to say you get used to it. You kind of do after that long. But I mean, even on the weekends by 6 o'clock, I, I wanted to go to bed. You know, you're exhausted. That's like my midnight. But I think there were several reasons why I stayed in that role. I was able to innovate it, right? Yeah. With a great support system. I mean, the people who work behind the scenes um, on the you know, on WNEP in the morning show and overall, they were super smart people, really creative. So I could talk to them. We would springboard ideas and just keep going. So it went from like Lecky Live, right, for a number of years. And then we started 
bringing viewers into the conversation through social media. We had a great digital team, like just bringing everybody into the conversation where we can yeah. know, not only using Lucky Live, right, to spotlight things going on in their backyard, but then using social media to bring people into the conversation, maybe in areas we wouldn't get to all the time, especially snowstorms, right? Sure, sure. So then I was able to innovate my role and I kind of took it as far as I could go. And during the pandemic, you know, I was sitting with like, what does my next 10 years look like? What does that plan look like? And those whispers kept getting louder and louder about some things I wanted to try. And I literally said to myself, I was like, do you want to be in your 40s looking back and saying like, why didn't I go shoot my shot? Why didn't I try this, right? I'm like, I'm not gonna die. I have my partner, Matt is phenomenal. I had a great mm -hmm. support system and it was just time. So like when my three year contract was coming up in uh, 2022 of May, you know, they offered me my job probably like 13 times. And I remember looking at my bosses and I said, I'm leaving here not because I have to earn more. I need to learn more. Yeah. Like I just wasn't I, where I wanted to be professionally. I did, did you know exactly where you wanted to go? Because I think yeah. a lot of people were surprised you had become an institution in a very short period of time. That makes me feel really ancient, but well, <laughs> an institution. <laughs> Look at me. Yeah, then. No, yeah. no, it's okay. But, but everybody expected Ryan Leckie to be a component, whether it's a charity or an yeah. event yeah. or anything offbeat. They expected you to be part of that. And, and you're at the station, which, hey, you're 50% plus market share. Like yeah. everybody's watching. Everybody yeah. gets it. Everybody knows who you are. Yeah all of that and and you make really a courageous decision well i'm not going to market hop i'm going to do something very different yeah i was so the market thing the market hopping was done for me because as social media kept getting bigger and bigger from youtube to TikTok to instagram to facebook here's the thing you can create content anywhere now right so you can create content that yeah. people might live in a rural rural part of tennessee and they're reaching millions of people from a youtube channel I just said like, I wanted to go do some stuff that just allowed freedom, right? Not being under a contract that says kind of like what you can and can't do. And it's standard across the industry. Yeah. At TV stations everywhere, radio stations, you name it, right? And I just said like, this this was the time. But I have to say, it, it the last couple months when I knew this chapter was gonna close, I was a hot mess. Like I, I want people to know, they look at it now and they're like, wow, look at you, you went out and launched your own, you know, Ryan Lucky Media, you know, social media marketing company and then some, and it mm -hmm. just seems like, wow, you just didn't, you just did it. I was an emotional mess for the past few months because the people I worked with for 17 years at WNEP, mm -hmm. I mean, they were family, right? Like people on the morning team, sometimes we forgot we were on television yeah. when we were so close. Remarkable stability. Tom Williams, yeah. Mindy Ramsey, Joe, like a lot of it, we had been together for one of the few teams in the country, I think for 11 years. And then Tom Williams, who I still talk to, he inspired me because he went out there and ran for state rep, right? Mm -hmm. So here's a guy who has kids, wife, and he's like, I'm gonna go do this. And I'm like, all right, I'm motivated. I can I go can do, do this. It. Because he knew in his heart, he's like, what's my next thing? You know, and that was for me. And the whispers kept getting louder, as I said, during the pandemic that I'm like, what does this next chapter look like? And I also didn't want to be in my 40s still covering snowstorms. I did yeah. it for 21 years, yeah. you know, and it was just time. Let, let's go back. Now, you you come onto the scene and you're in a younger generation than I, but you make a decision at some point to say, I'm I'm openly gay. Yeah. I, I, this, yeah. this is me. This is part. You never said, yeah. oh, this is everything. Yeah. But you said... I'm proud of who I am. This is who I am. Yeah. And did you get any resistance right. to that point? Or or was there any no. difficulties? I have to say, everybody who I work with, oh my gosh, super supportive, right? The team, and I said it was really, there were times where we forgot we were on television. We were so yeah. close. Tom and I, we'd be cracking joking. We're like, oh my gosh, I think people just saw that, right? Um, but when I came here, I, I knew, you know, you start figuring yourself out. And I mm -hmm. have to say, I'm a huge proponent of, of therapy and talking to a professional, right? And for me, I was really struggling with, I want to come out, but I don't know how to do it. And like, should mm -hmm. I just not? And it was, you know, through therapy and talking to my family and my friends and my coworkers about it. And then it wasn't like some big announcement, right? Mm -hmm. But it was just people started to get it and it's on social media and like, yeah. and I have to say one of the other things that was so a little difficult to make that last leap, but I think that's why I, I stayed, you know, people thought I left this area. I still live in Northeastern and Central Pennsylvania. Some people think I'm just sitting on my back porch eating bonbons now. I'm yeah. hustling a whole new career. Yeah. But the people in this area, oh my gosh, I, I love them. I'm obsessed. Yeah. Like I was at the grocery store today and someone's like, hey, and I'm a hugger. And it just feels like you know people. And I'm so grateful for that. That made it difficult to leave because literally when you would be on live shots or doing your thing and people would be like, hey, come on in for a cup of coffee. I know you're probably 20 in, but have another one, right? Mm -hmm. And you're just, you just felt so connected. 
like, and now I'm still able to keep in touch with people through my Facebook and Instagram yeah. and TikTok. And it's, it's so you're different. here. Yeah. Ryan Lecky Esaki. <laughs> now, uh, quickly, uh, tell, tell us about, you, you, you make this leap. Yeah. You've, you've come out. You've, yeah. Everybody knows who you are, all that. But you make this leap from Channel 16. That's another leap. Yeah. Tell me what you do. Terrifying at first, and people still ask, so I'm glad you asked that question, yeah. right? Um, because I haven't even had time to roll out like my own full-blown commercial. Yeah. So I launched Ryan Lucky Media. So I like to describe it. We are the Swiss Army Knife of that agency. So I have a lot of people on the team who are helping who are local and some people just outside of the area who have strong news backgrounds. So we are a social media marketing company that also turns full-blown commercials. Um, but we do everything from billboard creatives, graphic design work, website design work. And our bread and butter and what we love to do is to go into a company, whether it's a law firm, a manufacturing facility, facility, a fitness company. We go in and we shoot all of their social media content and we manage their pages. We edit it. We produce it. And I have to say, you know, people say, hey, it's Ryan Lucky Media. I always joke and say, when you hire me, you get the team. I yeah. wouldn't be where I am without the, like the 10 rock stars who are standing behind me. And I'm sure it was scary for them. It's like a small business. Yeah. Like, who is it? What's he going to do, right? But I started Ryan Lecky Media in June after I left. I literally had one day off. I, I, was, I left the show on Friday. I took Saturday off and I was working with a client on Sunday. You know, people are like, take two weeks. I'm like, I got to earn a living. Like my partner, Matt's like Susie Arman. He's like, you, we got bills to pay, right? He's like, get to work. Um, so anyway, yeah, and that's what happened. So we went in and, um, you know, now I have about like 10 clients, but I'm working with a lot of the same people who I worked with for 17 years. And I am so blessed and grateful for the opportunity that I had, not only from the viewers who would let me in their home and be like, all right, this hot mess, he's, he had too much caffeine today, but mm -hmm. I'll listen to what he has to say. Um, they were so great, but I think just, you know, this area who I was able to kind of go out and shoot my shot yeah. and work with some of those people who I met along my journey. So CEOs of companies who I can now call and be like, I got a wild idea for your healthcare company. I can do this for you on social media and we should cut these commercials. And I'm like, okay, because they know what I do. Yeah. And that's, that's helped out a lot to get in the door and to, to kind of do this next journey. Well, Ryan, so great to have you. We went yeah. over the time we had a lot. That's my but, bad. But, but I, no, oh, me? No, but, yeah, <laughs> right? but I anticipated yeah. that. Yeah. But I, I appreciate you coming on. And I'm, I'm happy people get a chance to, to see you on the other side of the interview. Yeah. And hear from and you. And this is and, tough and for me because I want to start peppering you with questions. That's what I'm used to. But I'm you like, do that some other yeah, time. That's yeah, okay. But I appreciate it. Uh, great to be with you and, and pleasure to have you. Thanks again. Ryan Lecky, thank you. Well, that's another week on the books. Uh, I thought, first of all, I was shocked by vaping. And I told Dr. France, let's finish up that subject. There are things I didn't know and that. I want to talk about again. And was Ryan Lecky everything we thought he would be? I mean, enthusiasm in a bottle. Uh, so that was a pleasure, too. And we're going to have next week, Brian Kilmeade is going to join us. We're not going to talk politics. We're going to talk about his books. He's a, he's a great historian. So we're going to get into that with Brian Kilmeade next Sunday and talk about the series of books he's written and some of the points that he... Uh, glean from his historical studies. So lots to do uh, for this week. So happy to be with you and look forward to next week. God will. The Bob Cordaro Show on T.